you. Thank you. What a great crowd. They told me America's finest and best were here. Now I believe it. I'm good friends with Ralph, and I think Ralph and the Freedom and Faith Coalition do a lot of good things around the country. I like even the, the title of it, Faith and Freedom. I think, I think you have to have both. I think you can't have faith without freely choosing faith. And I think you can't have freedom really without having people of faith. Our founding fathers put it this way. They said that a free people or a democratic people required virtue. That's the way Washington put it. A knowledge of right and wrong, a knowledge that there are things that are right and wrong. And when you think about it, and you think about it in our everyday lives, you think about, well, let's see, do I not steal because there's a law against it? Or do I not steal because it's wrong? Think about it. I mean, if, if what would the country be like if no one knew right and wrong and everybody was hooligans? You couldn't have enough police. You couldn't have enough law. So really, it is about having a virtuous people. <laughs> Oz Guinness, the writer and the theologian, put it this way. He said that liberty requires restraint. You just can't go out there and do anything you want. You have to know right from wrong. You have to restrain yourself. But he said that the only type of restraint consistent with liberty is voluntary restraint. It's us deciding to do the right thing. It's us being an example. It's us persuading our neighbors. It's us evangelizing to the community. Since I was a kid, I've been part of the pro-life community. Probably went... <laughs> my dad's an OB, I'm an ophthalmologist. In my training, I refused to participate in abortions, would never commit an abortion. <laughs> and every time I think, well, gosh, we're, we lose all the time, you know? We can't even defund Planned Parenthood. We try to do all this and we seem to lose. I try to think of where we might be winning. And I think we are winning the hearts and minds. Less and less physicians want to be associated with the grizzly practice. I mean, the idea, the repulsive idea of seeing, you know, Planned Parenthood selling body parts and the video of that struck home for people. So we are winning sometimes, I think, the persuasive argument that this is an awful, degrading, disgusting, and terrible thing for anybody to be involved with. But I will tell you that we still lose in the legislation. We still lose, and sometimes we lose because the people who come to you and give you lip service and say, oh, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life, and then they don't seem to vote that way. I'll give you an example. Last year, I tried to attach to a spending bill a prohibition to have any money spent by Planned Parenthood. You know what happened? They sat me down, and one of the senior Republican senators said, we cannot have the vote today. I said, why? He said, we might win. I'm not kidding you. This is a senior Republican sitting next to me on the floor of the Senate saying, we're not going to vote to defund Planned Parenthood because we might win. And I said, what does this mean? I said, does this mean that passing your spending bill, getting the Democrats to vote for your spending bill is more important than life? And he just smiled. See, that's what the thing is. You have Republicans that are more concerned with spending money than protecting the unborn. <laughs> but we are winning in some ways. And I, I'm a, the chief sponsor of the Life at Conception Act. I absolutely believe that that's when life began. <laughs> But I also think that when the other side comes back at us and they think it's really easy to talk about, oh, abortion when you can't see the baby. But what we need to come back and ask them is a very simple question. When does life begin? We know when life begins, but let's hear it from them. What is it? Is it in the nursery, as some have implied? Is it a year later, as some have said? Are we going to look and see if the child has disabilities? Think about it. Make them answer those tough questions. 
I think that in some ways we are winning the hearts and minds on this issue. I commend you for what you do on it and continue, continue to help us in the fight. With regard to a couple of other issues, internationally, I think it's very important that your money not be taken from you and sent uh, to persecute Christians around the world. Now, while I'm a big defender of the president, I'm personal friends with him, we get along great, we don't always agree. And on one of my disagreements is this. Frankly, I think that Saudi Arabia has done more to persecute Christians, to spread hatred of Christians and Jews and Hindus around the world than any other country. I don't think they deserve our arms. I don't think they should have nuclear technology. I think it's a big, big mistake to say, oh, you can do whatever you want, including chopping up a dissident with a bone saw, and we will continue to sell our weapons to you. Saudis have spent $100 billion around the world developing these madrasas by the tens of thousands. One madrasa in Pakistan that the Saudis support, 80% of the young boys who come out of this religious school join the Taliban to fight against Americans. We shouldn't be giving the Saudis one penny and one bit of our arms till they change their ways. Same goes double for Pakistan. Anybody remember, anybody remember Asia Bibi? Asia Bibi's a Christian in Pakistan. There aren't many Christians left. Less than, less than 1% of Pakistanis are Christians. She was arrested for wanting to draw water from a well in a Muslim village when the Muslim women began chanting, death to the Christian. They began stoning her and beating her with sticks. She was relieved when the police came because she thought, they've come to rescue me. She was accused, though, by the women of blasphemy against Islam, and she was put in jail. She was put on death row. She's been in prison for eight years. We have fought for her freedom. I have fought to not give Pakistan any money until she's released. We fought to and asked the president for, to give her asylum in our country, and I'm proud to remind you that Asia Bibi is now free and living in Canada and has escaped. <laughs> I'd like to end with this one issue. This is something that is close to my wife and I, and that is trying to help those who struggle with drug addiction and with, you know, the, just the horror and the scourge of what's going on in so many of our communities. Not only do we need to help these people, I think part of helping them is understanding that our kids who make these mistakes, locking them up for 25, 35, 40 years is not the answer. As, as Christians, we believe in redemption. We believe in second chances. We believe that as a fundamental part of our religion, that, you, that no one's beyond hope, that no one's beyond being saved. About six months ago, I was at the Louisville Urban League, and we were talking about the first step back, that Faith and Freedom Coalition was a big part of getting passed. I was a part of, my wife was a part of. And I was lobbying to try to get the leadership to let us have a vote. And so I was lobbying publicly through the television to the other senator from my state, please let us have a vote. And we had the vote, and the first person to be let out of prison was a man named Matthew Charles. I met him. He was given 35 years in prison for a drug crime. He served 21 of those years. He found Christ, he found religion, he got a college degree, he became a, a, a legal uh, a person recommending legal advice in the prisons. By all accounts, became a much better person. He was let out for two years because a judge said you've served your time. Another judge came back and said, no, you gotta go back to jail for 14 more years. This spring, when I'm at the Louisville Urban League talking to the cameras, he's in prison watching it on the prison television. And when I met him afterwards, he says, when I saw you say 
that it was going to be retroactive because his crime was committed in the 90s, I thought for the first chance, if this thing passes, maybe I'll get out of jail. So my wife and I have met him. He seems like a guy who you know, really wants a second chance in life and does deserve it. There have been problems with our drug laws. He's an African-American, and he was convicted for a type of drug that most white Americans have not been using, but the criminal penalties were 100 times worse for the type of cocaine he had as opposed to what a lot of whites use. So a white could have used the same, a white person could have used the same amount of cocaine and gotten six months in prison or probation, and he got 35 years. This has been wrong since the very beginning. The law should treat everybody equally. I want to thank Ralph Freed. I want to thank Faith and Freedom Coalition. I want to thank all of you for what you do. Don't give up because you give us hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>